This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. So, my name is Amanda Giles, and I'm going to talk to you guys about creating customizable widgets for unpredictable needs, um, which really means that I'm going to talk to you about creating widgets, and I'm going to talk to you about some ways to uh, kind of do that in a smart way. I did put a link up here if you're interested in following along on the slides, or when we get to the code, uh, this link will take you to uh, that information. So just to see if I can venture out here. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'll lose the video. Um, so just a little bit about who I am. I live up in New Hampshire, and I'm an independent IT consultant. I have my own business. Um, you could say I'm a WordPress consultant because that's most of what I do, but um, it's not 100% what I do. It's just uh, taken over more and more of my life uh, since 2009. I mostly develop themes. Um, I do develop plugins as well, but they are usually um, in combination with themes that I'm developing for people. I run the Seacoast New Hampshire WordPress meetup, so if you happen to live up closer to Portsmouth, we do two meetups every month, one geared towards users and one geared towards developers. So if you live somewhat close there, maybe get on the list and you know maybe it'll be worth a trip up there. I do some teaching and training, <laughs> largely as part of the meetup, sometimes privately. Uh, you may have heard earlier, I, have, I give big sneezes. Uh, I'm a lover, I'm a fighter. I think you should know something fun about me. Um, and my favorite quote is from Calvin and Hobbes. It's called, uh, virtue isn't better, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's not called, it's virtue isn't better than vice, it's just different. So, um, and, and I have cats. You're obligated to show cats if you have them. It's, see, it's, it's good for the smiles. That's Golden Stern and that's Calliope. Um, so who here has used a widget? Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> who here has created a widget before? Excellent. That's oh, good, good, go. Um, who spent a bunch of time trying to find the right widget and trying widget after widget after widget? There's more than that, okay. <laughs> uh, Excellent. Good. So this talk, it is geared towards developers. Um, but if you're not a developer, don't go. Don't go. I hopefully I have something for you as well. <laughs> what? <laughs> so what do I have for you? Good question. <laughs> um, if you're not a developer, some of this is, is going to be not of interest to you, but hopefully um, it will show you that it's not too hard to customize a widget. Um, you might actually convince a plugin developer to customize a widget for you. True story, there's a column short codes plugin that I install on a lot of sites because it makes it very easy for clients to make their own uh, contents, content columns, table-like things that aren't tables that respond much better. Um, and it's a great plugin. It's got one, two, three, four, or six columns. Yeah, I got tired of adding the fifth column. I finally wrote the plugin developer, and I was like, could you please just put five columns in there? Or maybe it was he had five columns, but he was missing three fifths. Or anyways, he was missing this one thing, and I finally just wrote him. And like 24 hours later, he was like, oh yeah, go download the new one. And he had just put it in there. He just just never occurred to him. So I'm not saying that's always going to happen. Your mileage may vary, um, but sometimes you might suggest a feature that a plugin developer is, is all about. They just never occurred to them. The other thing that I hope might become clear is that if you find a widget that's very close to what you need, that you might um, convince a developer, hire a developer to modify it, say, look, this is what I want. I just need this small change. I've certainly done that on a number of widgets. I've taken it for a site and said, okay, I need to add this one extra thing or change the way this one piece works. But if you're starting with a widget that's close, you're 90% there, possibly. So, um, And the other thing, of course, which I personally hope because I am a programmer, is that you'll roll up your sleeves and, uh, and maybe get in there and do your own coding. But if you're not a PHP programmer, that might not be the first place to start. So, What is a widget? You guys have all used them, so this should be old, this should be, uh, old hat, but... A widget is a way for you to take input from a user uh, via those forms in the back end and turn that into output on the front end. 
and they're designed to be very easy to use. You can drag and drop them in that area. You get whatever input the user wants, and the output gets generated. They can use the widget as many times as they want. They can use it wherever they have a widget area. So they're very convenient, reusable pieces of code when they're done right. Um, you've all seen this before. If you've used them, of course, these are some default widgets from WordPress. You drag them over, you get some choices, you save it, and WordPress does its magic to turn that into um, the output. So <laughs> if you ask me, why do you create your own widgets? This is, this is the first thing I always think of, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's only half true. Um, I like to just create something right off the bat that's flexible, that's going to meet my user's needs, and is also going to let me go off and do creative new stuff and not maintain the site. Um, but on a more serious tact on that would be that creating widgets is a way for you to control the content for your users, but hopefully give them some choices about that content, what that content is or how it's displayed. And because of the very nature of wi widgets, you're going to control the content and its presentation and also that the user can control its location. And hopefully the user can control some of those other aspects too, but they essentially can do it in a very controlled environment. So what I mean, you know, when I titled this talk, Creating Customizable Widgets, one of the things I recommend and try to do is to anticipate what choices or variations the user might want. And for developers, offering ways to adjust the output where feasible. So we'll get to, we'll, to, to break this down a little more. So for users, I said anticipate choices or variations the user might want. I am a, a really firm believer in giving the user lots of choices. There is also a philosophy in the WordPress community about not giving the user too many choices. So where you walk that line is up to you. But what I mean by anticipating choices is, um, for example, offering ways to filter the content that's being shown, offering choices about how that content is shown. So what, an example of a widget that we're going to look at is one that displays posts. And we're going to give um, control over what kind of content shows, but we're also going to show for the posts that show, give them choices about whether the thumbnail is shown and, and other information. So not just what content, but then how it is shown. Um, and offering style choices, or at the very least providing some very basic clean styling where you're just using you know, standard elements that will then look like the rest of your user's theme, um, or even no styling at all. So it's up to you. And for developers, what I recommend is offering ways to adjust that output. And so now we're not talking about the user form, now we're talking about in the back end code. And for me, that boils down to two main things. The first is to make sure that all of the output elements are tagged um, with IDs and appropriate classes so that your users or other developers can style those elements and that they don't have to, you know, they don't have to jump through hoops to say, well, it's the second list item that's completely unnamed, you know, in my output. So, you know, write it the way you would want to write it if you wanted to, you know, every single thing might want to be targeted by somebody. So, um, at the very least, do that. The other thing is to use hooks to allow for filtering of the output. And we'll, we'll talk a little more, a bit more about hooks. But hooks are something your users will never see, but a developer who wants to modify your widget could use hooks to do so, and hopefully without having to copy all of your code and essentially make their own widget. So. How's everybody doing? Good? With me? All right. Uh, so the anatomy of a widget, we'll look at this in code in a minute, but it breaks down to these five pieces. And the first one is our declaration. It's called our construct, if you've done any programming. And this is where we're basically going to tell WordPress, you know, what is this widget? What's the name of it? Um, we're going to give it just information about how to identify the widget. Another, the second piece of the widget of the widget anatomy is the user interface or the form. So this is that form that appears when you drag the widget over into a widget area and you open up that form. We're going to create that form. 
Once we've created that form, of course, we need to have an update save piece of logic so that the user's choices are saved um, in the system. Most importantly, then, we have to have the widget output logic, which is going to turn that saved input into a widget on the, into the output on the screen when somebody visits the front end of your website. And the first four of those all get put into a, a class, and then the fifth piece is to actually register that class. And the beauty of WordPress is that we get to build upon the widget structure that WordPress has already built for us. So it's one of the great things here. We're not doing this all from scratch. We get to kind of reuse bits of the WordPress core code. So this is a very s simplified and, and completely empty widget code structure. This is just to, to let you see. I wish I was over here. <laughs> so the very top of this, hopefully you can read, it says class, show posts, underscore widget, extends WP underscore widget. So that's the part where I talked about we get to kind of sit on top of the WordPress code. We get to have access to all of the things it already does. So we create this class structure, and then this breaks down into the four pieces we talked about. So up at the top, that's our name, and that's our bit where we're extending the WP widget, so we get all of the, the WordPress goodness. This is our declaration construct. These will all obviously have code in them, but I just kind of wanted to be able to show you the the, um, the high-level view. The second piece, our user interface form, very aptly named function form. We're going to move on to the update save logic. Again, very aptly named update. And finally, widget, which is going to be our output. And then you can see we close that class container. So we put in a curly bracket at the end. And you can see a comment there. And then we um, register the widget using the name. So you can see down there we're using, we have a function that's registering the widget, and then underneath we have this add action. Uh, spoiler alert, that's a hook, but that is a hook that um, hooks into widget init, which tells WordPress, hey, by the way, we have another widget here that should be on the list, and that uh, ties it all into our system for us. So I'm going to show you the simple text widget, but then I'm going to kind of walk you through a show post widget. And uh, it's just going to be a very simple widget, but it will uh, obviously allow us to show the widget title. I'm going to allow one or more post IDs. We're going to allow people to pick custom post types, number <coughs> of posts, sort by, sort order, and then a couple extra choices about whether they want to display the post thumbnail and whether or not they want to display the full post cons uh, content or the excerpt. Oh, we're going to go to it right now. Excellent. So let me just show you the simpler, uh, I'm going to show you the text widget in WordPress first. Is that big enough for you guys to see? Yes? A little bigger? A little bigger? Okay. How's that? Okay. So before we get to the show post widget, this is, um, I actually kind of like the old structure. At one point, WordPress had all the widgets in a little widgets folder. It was great. But now they're all in a file called default-widgets. So we're just looking at one widget in this file. But this file in the WP includes directory is a great file to look in if you're looking for examples on writing a widget or, like I said, you want it you know, take one and play with it. You could copy uh, the code to your own theme or a function or a plugin, I mean, and, uh, and play with it. So right up here, like we talked about, we have, I will not highlight that, it makes it hard to read. We have WP widget text. So that's extending our WP widget. And then the first thing we have is this construct. And it's got a couple lines because it's breaking some of the options out into arrays. But essentially, the heart of it is this um, construct text here where we are passing in the name of the function, the widget, which is text, and then we're also passing in some other, uh, this, these other arrays of information. So we're passing in a class name, we're passing in a description. Scroll over. Yep. So if that's the information that's showing, you're probably all familiar with that on the widget screen. So when you look at that widget, that's the information that's going to tell your user what the widget does. 
clearly important. So these are not in the same order. I'm going to kind of put them, look at them in the same order, though, as we have them. So the next thing I would look at is the form function. And again, this is inside that class that we built. And the form function is pretty straightforward. We get passed in the instance. This is a field that has, it's um, an array that has all of the bits of information that were saved on the form the last time. So when you create a widget and you drag it into an area and you put the settings there, that's one instance of your widget. And all of the choices you made about what's in there or whatever code you put in, maybe you put in some MailChimp code or maybe you just put in a, you know, like on my site I have a little meetup logo that links to my meetup. So it could be anything, but that uh, what gets passed in is the previous data because of course when you go to edit your form, your widget, and you look at that form, you want it to show all of the settings that you already had set as a user. You don't want to be seeing a blank screen every time. So that's why that gets passed in. And then we're pretty straightforward. We're, we're putting out a couple paragraphs with labels and input boxes um, with our fields. And what you'll notice is some, um, what looks a little, not quite as straightforward as if you were maybe just writing it yourself because we're using some of the widget um, functionality in that, we're, that we got from the WP widget. So we're using this uh, function called getFieldID to generate an ID for this field. And then we are also, when we get to the input box, we're using getFieldName to generate a name. And that's that bit where we're saying you want to have an ID on everything. Um, you want to make things identifiable. This is on the admin side, so it's not as important, but. So we have two paragraphs, each with a label and an input. We've got our text field, we've got our text area, and then we have one extra option at the bottom here, which is our uh, checkbox. See where I get the label, there it is. Automatically add paragraphs. So you've all seen that at the bottom. So that's our, that's our form. We go up to our update. The update gets, let me just move this to the top of the screen. So the update gets two arrays coming in. One is the new instance, so the new settings the user put, and the other is the old instance. So in case you need to make changes based on comparing the old and the new values. Um, and also you default, when you come in here, you can see the first thing that we do is we default instance. Ah, there we go instance to equaling the old instance. So we start with all of the values that were already set, and then you go through and grab the new values. You can see here for the title, we grab new instance title, and we run a strip tags on it in case they put anything in there that we don't want to save. And there's a couple other just small checks here. It says uh, if current user can unfiltered HTML. So that's one of WordPress's core security abilities. Never heard of that one, but. Um, so WordPress is behaving a little differently based on the security level of the user. And then setting the, the last field down here, the filter field, and then it's returning the new value. So most of the time, this is pretty cut and paste. You're gonna make sure you have everything that was on your form. You wanna save all of those values. If something's not saving, check in here. So we have our, we've created our form, we've saved the form values for our widget, widget instance, and the next thing that happens is our, uh, the most important piece, the output here of the widget. So this is what runs when the user, when your visitor visits your website to see the, um, the widget in action. They don't know it's a widget, it's just something on their site. They have no idea. So the two parameters here are the args, which are the arguments that are set up for the widget itself, and the instance. So the args, uh, has anybody done theme development where you've created a widget area? You've done like a register sidebar? So when you call register sidebar, if you're like me most of the time, you just copy it out of the codex. But one of the things it puts you put in there are, you know, before the title and after the title, and. You, you put 
a number of things. You put these things. No, that's not the right one. Sorry. Sidebar. You put these things. So this is just what they look at look like spit out into an array. But when you create that that widget area, you are giving it a name. You're giving it identifier. You're giving it a description, and you're giving it some other information about how to deal with the presentation. So before widget, after widget, before title, after title. If you want in your widget, you can, you know, you 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 get all of those things passed in. I think you can actually just ignore them all if you want, but that would be mean. You should really should. They get passed in for a reason. They're how it's supposed to look. So. You get those things passed in, the instance is all of those values that were set by the user. So, right in here we're going to, they grab the title, the widget title, they actually apply a filter to it, and we'll kind of save hooks and filters for after this, so um, suffice to say we grab the title, we grab the content down here, and then we actually start echoing content out. So previously we were returning something or we were saving something. Here we're actually getting the input and then we're <coughs> echoing it out right out to the screen for the user. So we are echoing out the title and you can see here we're using, we're being good, we're using the before title and after title and right in between we're putting the title that the user entered when they filled out that form and then we're putting a div with a class text widget and we're putting, um, we're putting our content and we are either running it through WP Auto P, which adds those paragraphs or not, based on whether they checked that checkbox. And that is all we are doing in this particular instance. It's about the simplest widget I could find, probably. How's everybody doing? Good? Not losing anybody? Okay, another pizza. <laughs> all right, so the show post widget Please interrupt me with questions if you have them. I feel very lonely up here. So. <laughs> um, so the show post widget, I'm going to run this by in two passes. I'm, I'm not going to you know, write it live for you because I would really put you to sleep. Um, but I'm going to show it to you kind of in a first pass, and then we're going to talk a little bit about hooks, and then I'm going to come back and show you some extra things that we can add in here. So we're going to start... Uh, right at the top, so we have this show post widget, just like the example, and again, always very important, you're going to extend WP widget, that's how you get all of the good stuff that WordPress does automatically. And then in our construct, this is where we're going to create the widget. Uh, the first thing that I'm actually doing is I'm allowing for internationalization, so I'm loading in a plugin text domain. You don't have to do this, but it'd be nice to think that somebody might want to translate your widget someday. And if you just do this up front, it makes it very easy. And then the next thing I'm doing is the construct for the, the widget. And I just happened to have broke it out into a few lines. The text widget that we looked at before had it as an array instead. It's personal preference. I'm passing the same information. So I'm passing it an identifier, show post widget. And then I'm also passing it the name. And when I'm passing it the name, you notice the second part of, um, of this string is this show post widget domain. And that is my, that's just my translation string information. So that is not doing anything at the moment because there isn't a translation available. But were my plugin to be translated, this is one of the strings that could be translated, show post widget, so that if somebody was reading it, in Arabic or Spanish, they would see something that would make more sense to them. Is that what that underscore yeah, this under it's actually a double underscore. And uh, so double underscore is basically just to translate it. So if there is a translation, it would return it. If not, it will return that show post widget if it can find that string in the translation. Um, otherwise, it just defaults to it. If you see an E there, that means same thing, but it's going to echo it out. So it's actually gets actually underscore E. We'll see one shortly. And then the last part of this is my description. And again, it's description, my description, and I also just have this show post widget domain. So don't get too hung up on that, but I wanted to set a good example.
So of course somebody's going to want to translate your domain. It's going to your widget. It's going to be wildly popular. So after this, I am actually doing a couple extra things in here. Um, this constructor is a good spot to kind of um, set some global things, kind of do some housekeeping. So what I'm doing up front here is I know that for my widget, I am going to want to use the um, post types that are in the system. I want to make uh, let the user choose. So I am actually... Um, setting up post types and using the get post types array within WordPress. And I'm just doing that up here so I don't have to do it every time. I can just do it in the construct and it's there. The other thing I'm doing is setting up um, an array of order by values. And this is, again, some choice from my user. I, I'm a big believer in choice. I like to give my users choices, anything that they might want. Um, again, I don't want them calling me later because they want the one choice that I left off the list. Um, so I just I try to be thorough up front. So you can see here I have pretty typical menu order, publish date, title, comment count, slug, ID, random. These are all the things that if you're familiar with the loop or you've done a query post or a WP query call, they should all look familiar. I'm not, not making any of them up. I'm just... Um, just wanting to essentially give the user the choice of, of what WordPress gives them. And then the last one is a given ID order. So, and you'll notice on the left, all of those directly correspond to the exact string you would pass to WP Query. So, um, no need to make it any harder or more obscure. Just going to stick with um, stick with it, with exactly what WordPress wants. Um, and then the same thing with ascending descending. So again, I'm just setting another array. Array. So that's this um, this dollar sign this, and I can't remember the name of this construct, but it's essentially a class notation. It's saying you know this is a uh, variable in my class, and I can access it anywhere within these these functions. Actually, why don't I show you guys what this looks like first? Let me go too far in here. So let me. Um, I created this as a plugin. So I just have my one widget area, and then down here I have my show post widget. And so it's got my title, it's got my text, show one or more posts of your choosing. I'm going to drag it in here. And like I said, how much choice you give is up to you. I like, I guess because I'm a developer, I like having choices. Um, so the first choice up here is the title. I also have a post IDs, and I have a little note there that says comma separated list if more than one. It's not a very pretty note. We'll kind of hit it on the second pass and make it look a little nicer. Post type, so this is where I'm pulling in from WordPress. This is just a standard install, so I just have post pages media. Number of posts to display, my sort by fields, which I'm generating from that array that we already created. My sort order, and then I have two checkboxes, display thumbnail or display full post. So those directly correspond right at the beginning of my form function. I'm taking the instance that was passed in, and if I have values for those, I'm using those values. It could be that this is the first time that this form is coming, so in that case, I'm setting some defaults here. And we saw some of these in action already. I'm defaulting to post, I'm defaulting to three posts, and I'm defaulting to date descending order. So, um, and on my site, if I do, if I just save this, let's give it a title. And on my site, if you, if you look on the right hand side, these are my post descending. So, hello universe, hello galaxy, hello world. Um, and then you can see on the left, you can see the same thing mimicked here. Not very exciting yet, not really any formatting.
So these all correspond to that, those are my defaults. And then the next thing that happens is I generate that form that the user is seeing where they're putting in their input. So um, if you've ever worked in HTML and created a form, then you're gonna be very familiar with this. If you haven't, then that's, that's the big piece you need to know. But I'm just creating a div and then I'm creating paragraphs for each of the elements. I'm using a label and I'm using the input field, which in most cases is a text field. Inside of these that looks like a lot of code is just those functions I was talking about where I'm using get field ID and get field name. And I'm doing that and letting WordPress do the work of generating um, those for me. And then over here you can see this underscore E, this is that translation bit, but specifically echoing it out. So I'm echoing out title, and then I'm using, this is just my text domain if I was translating it. Because I don't, it's always gonna say title right now. But I have hopes. <laughs> so each of these fields, I'm, I'm not gonna bore you going through every single field. They're, all the fields that we saw are get created down here. Um, the one you can see here, this is the post type select. And so for this, instead of having an input field, I have a select field. And then I have a for each loop where I'm looping through the post types that I created there and generating those option tags. And I do the same thing further down with the order by. So all of this code is on the slides. So you can look at it later. <laughs> um, Clearly, I'm not going to go over every line of code. I have to really loose you then. Um, a couple checkboxes at the end. And then the, the next thing we're going to do is the updating. So we want to, uh, again, we have old instance, new instance. We start with the old instance, and then we see if any new values were um, provided. And then we save those. And the only thing unusual here I'm doing is I, for the post IDs, I let them put in a comma separated list. So if they had three specific posts they wanted to show on the side. And what I'm doing here in this for loop is I'm just taking apart that list and putting it into an array. Just easier, to, easier for me to read later. I just take it apart now instead of having to deal with it later. And then in my widget, I'm getting my standard arguments in from where, when the widget area was defined with my register sidebar, and then I'm getting dollar sign instance, which is my actual, um, the actual user choices that the user made. And I'm gonna do an extract on both of those, which is gonna take each of those, turn it into a PHP variable for me without me having to pull them out one by one. And then I basically set up a query based on what they put in. So I'm creating a blank array called query arguments, and then I'm going through and checking all of these different values that we put in, which of course are everything you would use in a WP query, and I'm generating um, the array for that, and then down, down at the bottom here you can see that I'm actually running my WP query. And then I just start putting things out. So I'm gonna echo the before widget value that I got from um, what was originally set in my register sidebar. N note that I could just ignore that. I could say, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna do my own thing. Um, I don't recommend that, but you can. If your widget is that different, you really think that you shouldn't have whatever the theme developer thought should be there, you can certainly do that. Um, WordPress is sometimes like that. It's a little bit of the wild, wild west. Um, I recommend doing it, but you, when you're writing the widget, you can do it whatever way you want. So. So we're gonna stick that out. Uh, then again with the title, same thing. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna follow what my theme developer said. I'm gonna do my before title, my title, and then my after title. And then I'm gonna loop through. This is gonna look just like a regular, um, might look like a regular file in your theme that you have. I'm gonna loop through my posts. I'm gonna output it. I'm gonna check if they, if they uh, said show image and there is actually an image, then I will um, display that. I'm displaying a thumbnail and I'm giving it a left align class. And then same thing with the with the checkbox for the full content. I'm either showing the full content or the excerpt. 
So if you've done any theme development or loop work, that should look very familiar. And then I'm resetting the post data. Very important. Yes? If you move your theme, widget will, uh, WordPress will take your widgets and put them in the inactive widgets area. So if you switch themes, WordPress saves your settings, but they can't, because the widget areas get defined in themes, they, they can't, um, they don't know where to, they won't know where to put your widgets if you switch themes, because a new theme would have completely different widget areas defined. So it takes all your widgets, it puts them under inactive widgets, and then you have to drag them back to where you want them. But yeah, widget areas are theme specific. Specific, so. All right, and then the very bottom, this is the most important thing because if you forget this, you won't see your theme anywhere. So this is the uh, registering of the widget and it's tied to this widget in its action down here. And that's what uh, ties it all together, makes it show. How are we doing? Questions? Okay. Keep going. Uh. So the second pass will be briefer, I promise. I wanted to throw in a few other things. I didn't want to make it too complicated the first time through. So on the second pass, we're going to flush a couple things out. We're going to add some style, both for the admin and for the widget output, and we're going to put some hooks in there to allow filtering on different elements. So this is going to be the quickest hooks lesson I've ever given, but um, does anybody know what hooks are? Yes, a few people, okay. So a hook is essentially an event, and it's something built into WordPress, and it allows for additional code to be run at a point in time. So WordPress itself is built with a whole bunch of hooks. That's why it's, it's so lovely as a developer. WordPress leaves all of these hooks in so that at various points, if you decide you want to do something cool, you don't have to hack your core files. You just use the hook that hopefully WordPress has left you. Um, same with theme developers. And one or more functions can be associated with that hook, that event, and WordPress will run them automatically when that hook is, is triggered. So hooks are, as I mentioned, they're placed within WordPress core, they're placed within plugins, they're placed within themes, and they're placed there to allow customization um, by developers without directly editing the code. So you always hear like, don't edit WordPress core, and of course you know if you edit a plugin, then you can't upgrade it. Um, hooks are how you get around that. And hooks are, um, hooks are really the proper way to alter that code. It's not always possible. Sometimes the developer doesn't leave you the hook you need. Um, but it's always worth checking. It's always easier to just use a hook. They're a little complicated the first time, but once you get the hang of it, they're a lot easier and they're a lot safer than um, just hacking into the code or copying the plugin and making your changes willy-nilly. So there's two types of hooks. There are action hooks, which are basically points where WordPress says, yeah, okay, now you, do whatever code you want, and then it passes back. And WordPress has a whole bunch of hooks like this at different points. Uh, we've already seen some of them. We added a hook for widgets and knit. And we said, hey, by the way, when you're registering widgets, over here, do this one too. And we, WordPress stopped when it got there and it said, hey, are there any widgets to initialize? And chances are you have one or more plugins that have something tagged to that widgets and knit. And WordPress will run those and it will even um, run them in a certain order. So if you have something that needs to run before or after something else, um, typically it just defaults to a priority of 10, but you can set that lower or higher. So you can play with that. The other type of filter uh, hooks, and these are the hooks that uh, we're gonna see in the widget, are called filter hooks. And what they allow you to do is, in this case, WordPress doesn't just stop for you and allow you to run your code. WordPress stops, will pass you some data, you can do whatever you want with the data, and you pass it back. So you can filter that data, you can filter, it could be content, it could be a title, it could be um, settings. I'll show you how we'll, we'll, uh, we'll set up some filters for the settings. And basically it's a chance for, 
if you know you really like the plugin and you but you want to do this one other thing a filter is a way for you to uh, change that or l let's say you um, you hate the word archive in the title you write a filter and just remove the word archives <laughs> from the title anytime somebody tries to put it on so that's the filter hooks are what we're going to look at here but we did use already we already used some action hooks when we um, for the add action to register the widget is the most obvious example I can think of. So, one more bit of code. I'm gonna actually make this pretty straightforward. Just to, let's see if this will work on screen. No, that's gonna be too tight, isn't it? So, I created two versions of this widget. So this is largely the same code, but one of the things that I added in the construct here is I added, oh, okay, I did use regular hooks here. I added two action hooks. This add underscore action is an action hook, and when we later when we see apply underscore filters, that means it's activating a filter hook. So this add action here, I'm actually adding, um, calling, <coughs> the hook that I'm hooking into is this first string. So the uh, the first hook there is called WP and Q scripts, and this is where you in Q scripts for the front end of your site, so website visitors that come to your site. And the second one, admin in Q scripts, is scripts for your admin area. Uh, same idea. And these actually both the way that the way that they act the hooks call hooks work is that the first part is the hook and the second part is the function. And in this case, because we're in a class, we do this kind of funky thing where we say array this, this is my class object, and then the name of the function. And if I were to look down at the bottom here, inside my class, I added two additional functions here. Uh, to, to register styles. So I have a showpost.css, that's my output styles, and I have an admin.css that are um, some admin styles. And else did I add? Okay, 186. Some sh shortcuts. So the next thing down here is on the widget. So when we actually output the widget, I added some hooks here. And the first one I added here is, is an apply filters hook. So that's a, a filter hook, and I, I'm applying it to the arguments for the widget. So I'm essentially giving a theme or other a theme developer a chance to say, that's not really what I wanted to do. I don't really want to make that widget title in H3. Maybe I want to make it in H2 or something. So this is where I can take all of those, those um, before title, after title, those things and modify them. And then do the same thing. Oh yes, so then down at the bottom, after I've developed, so I went through all the options and put all my query arguments together, then I give a developer another chance to do something special. So I actually pass them all of the arguments I set up for my WP query, I give them a filter hook, and I'm essentially saying, here, here's the array for my query. If there's anything you want to change in it, you know, maybe you want to exclude your sitemap page always or something. Maybe there's something fun, you know, that you want to make sure that your user that's specific to your site you don't, don't want to happen. So I don't, the point is, I don't know what the developer might want to do. I just know that they might sometime want to do something a little different, a little custom, it isn't very dangerous to leave these in here because only a developer is going to get in here. Um, so you're not really complicating things for your user, but you are making some developer somewhere like really happy when they when they need that one instance and they can just apply this. So, and then I did one other thing down here with the um, show image. If you recall before, 
I was just showing as a thumbnail and I was always aligning it left. Uh, okay. And so what I did instead here was I added two filters, show post widget image attributes and show post widget image size. And I'm still defaulting to thumbnail left, but I'm now giving the developer a choice. So the way that I would do this if I wanted to in my theme, so this is my functions file in my theme. It's a very small theme. It's just a <laughs> child theme with one function. And, um, but this is the way that I would, if I wanted them to show medium images, I created a function here, um, BWP, show post Im widget image size. That's whatever I want to name the function. And what I'm getting passed in is the thumbnail size. So by default, it's always going to be thumbnail. In this case, I'm taking this function name and I'm putting it as the second argument here. My first argument is that hook name that I put in the widget and I'm calling add filter. And when this gets, if I have this in my theme, when I get to that point in the code, I'm going to run this function and I'm always going to change thumbnail to medium. Now I could do something more savvy here. I could be like, oh, only on the home page, I want to show larger thumbnails or something. Um, it, it doesn't matter, but, but the point is the choice is there. You can't assume that everybody always wants thumbnail. They might have a custom size, so. All right, I did it. Questions? I know there's a lot of code to throw at you like at 8.30 at night. <laughs> Yes? Oh, oh. oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, time for that, of course it works. Uh, yeah, let's put the, did I pull a foot filling in? Yes. All right, so this is the full widget. And I'll show you two things. So on the back end now, I did a little bit of styling here so you can see this comment. I'm now putting it on another line. I'm doing it like italicized and a lighter color. So everything looks just just a little neater. And then on the front end, oops, here, let's put the thumbnails on there. So I can put my thumbnails on here. I took away the little bullet point lists and I put my, my thumbnails there. Now if I go and save my theme to change it to medium, now you can see that picture is bigger and so it's pushing that content down. But that's a big difference. If you were a developer dropping that in, having the text over here or having it underneath. So, um, yeah. All right, thank you guys very much. This is places you can find me. If you go to this link, it will take you to my website and uh, it will have, has all of the code in the slides. Oh, I'm sorry, you had a question too. I did. I created the plugins. Sorry, it's so close. Um, I created a plugin, and it just to start, it just had the one file. It's one PHP file that creates this widget. In the second round, I also added the two CSS files. So admin CSS and show uh, show posts.css. Well, it. You have themes that come with widgets, but oftentimes widgets are independent of themes, and so they would normally be in a plugin then. The only other way for somebody to get it would be to drop this code into their theme, and the idea is it, for it to be more portable than that. So I definitely recommend putting it in a theme, I mean in a plugin, sorry. It's just a good, it's a good practice. Yes? First you cry. <laughs> um, you could, I mean, again, you could contact the plugin developer and say, like, could you please put a filter here? Um, what I usually end up doing <coughs> is I usually end up taking, and that, at, at that point, first of all, I go check if they have a hook. So I look for those functions, the widget or the form, wherever it is, I need the hook. And if it's not there, I'll usually copy the widget, and I will put it into my 
into its own plugin or put it into my theme and I will make the edit. But it's a bummer then because then you're not getting any of the upgrades. Yeah, I end up going in there sometimes and like changing the name, which gets kind of complicated. You have to change it everywhere. Um, even today, I named my widget apparently the same thing as somebody else. So when I had it as version one, it tried to tell me that it wanted to upgrade it. So I made it version two because I, I actually did write it for an earlier presentation. So it got some updates, but great. Yeah. It's a good presentation. Amanda. Thank you very much. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. You're very patient. I know it's at the end of a long day. Anyways, I, thank you very much, and I'll hang around a little bit if you have questions, but I, I appreciate it. Have a good night.